And let's switch you over to the host. Okay. Here, I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, let's see here. Okay. And now I'm just going to um, make my slides fill the window. I'm going to put it on slideshow. Mm. Sometimes this takes a second to happen. Okay, there we go. Now I'm just going to um, good if I can move my toolbar up a little bit so I can see. Do you know if there's a way to kind of like collapse the toolbar to make it so it's not blocking part of the screen? Mm. I see what you mean. It's blocking just a little bit of the bottom. Here, I, I hid the floating, the floating media controls. Okay. Okay. So anyway, that should be an option for anybody else. There's like um, three dots at the right of the toolbar. And um, you can um, click that and it'll um, hide the, the, the float, the, the so-called floating media controls. Um, Okie doke, now just a second here. I gotta, let's see. Okay, good. I wonder if I can put my, um, I think I'll, I'll stop stop fiddling with things now. Scoot this over to scoot, scoot this over to the side. Okay, so uh, hi everybody. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be here to talk about uh, bumblebees and native plants. And um, yeah, so my name's Dave, um, and I'm the educational specialist for um, Meadow City Native Plant Nursery, um, which is a, a new nursery um, on the east side of Cleveland. Um, so I was a Columbus resident. Uh, I, I moved up to Cleveland um, April 1st, but prior to that, I was a Columbus resident for uh, 12 years. And I, I went to grad school uh, at Ohio State in the School of Environment and Natural Resources and focused on e ecological restoration. Um, and I earned my MS and I um, then worked for uh, a number of years in the soil chemistry lab. And I, I was um, a pretty active with um, the uh, Society for Ecological Restoration at, uh, at Ohio State, which is just a really great student organization. And um, you know, uh, helped out with uh, restoring uh, space along the Olentangy River. And, um, you know, I was very happy to, uh, be, you know, interact and uh, collaborate with Flo uh, during that time. So, um, uh, yeah, but now, now I'm, you know, up in Cleveland with a couple friends from OSU and um, we started this native plants nursery. And um, yeah, so part, part of what I do is just uh, share information about native plants and their benefits with uh, garden clubs and other interested groups. So um, today I'm, I'm happy to be, uh, you know, talking about uh, this particular topic. And uh, so I'll just go ahead and get started. The presentation is called A Time for Bumblebees, Native Plants in the Garden and a Pollinator's Life Cycle. I'm just gonna... Hopefully my slides advance if I just hit the arrow button, I would think that they would. Hmm. Let's see here. Okay, now hold on. I just want to make sure that that wasn't a one time thing. Okay, good. Here we are. All right. So, um, yeah, so it, I think even though, you know, we're all familiar with a lot of these ideas, it helps 
to um, de define just what native plants are. So uh, native plants are plants that are present in a, in a given area as a result of natural phenomena, as opposed to uh, being introduced by people. So in most cases, this means these plants have been present for um, you know, a really long time. Uh, so thousands of years, at least. And um, it, it, so basically what happened was, uh, you know, a long time ago, these plants colonized the landscape uh, via their own uh, seed dispersal mechanisms, and they occupied places that were conducive to their growth. So these were primarily areas where the soil had the pH and moisture retention characteristics that were helpful to the plant. So because of this, there is a really cool correspondence between maps of Ohio's uh, soil features and maps of its native plant communities. So uh, for instance, on the left, what we have is a map of Ohio's glacial deposits. This is just the soil material that was left in place uh, with the retreat of the glaciers. And on the right, we have a map of Ohio's pre-colonial um, plant communities. So this is prior to European colonization. And you can see just how closely the two maps uh, mirror one another. And it's just a really nice illustration of how native plants are tied to the landscape. So um, since native plants have been present in the area for so long, they have, uh, uh, there's been enough time for uh, the regional wildlife to evolve the ability to utilize these plants as a food source. So the native plants no longer exist just as plant communities, but rather as the center of entire biodiverse ecosystems. So um, in central Ohio, for instance, um, we have uh, the beech maple forest community uh, is one of our major plant communities. And that in turn is the center of the beech maple forest ecosystem. Uh, and some care, you know, creatures that would historically be in that ecosystem are <clears throat> the rosy maple moth, the wood thrush, and the black bear. Okay, so how is our native biodiversity doing? Um, unfortunately, the numbers are not good for a lot of our native wildlife. Um, since 1970, there's been a 29% loss of North American birds uh, getting closer to home. Uh, there has been a 33% loss in Ohio butterflies uh, since the mid 1990s and 26% of North American bumblebees are threatened with extinction. So there are a lot of factors that are contributing to these trends, but overall the number one factor is habitat loss. And that habitat loss is stemming from um, agricultural expansion and increasing urbanization. All right, so what can we do about it? Well, the good news is, whoops, sorry. The good news is that our yards represent a tremendous opportunity for habitat restoration. Um, and this is because uh, our, our yards are comprised of lawn, 40 million acres of lawn in the US. And lawn doesn't serve as a source of food or shelter to wildlife. So <clears throat> if we convert uh, just a portion of that lawn to a uh, native plant focused landscape, and this could uh, merely be increasing the size of our gardens, then we're really doing something to uh, uh, help out our uh, declining wildlife. So we want to be planting uh, native plants in these spaces because that those are the plants that the wildlife have evolved to eat. And in particular, we want to make sure we're including certain species that support a disproportionately large amount of biodiversity. And I have some of these species 
uh, shown uh, on the slide here. So if you're gonna be planting trees, uh, the oaks, the cherries, and the willows are the top three groups of trees that are gonna be supporting the most biodiversity. If you're gonna be planting wildflowers, the goldenrods, the uh, sunflowers, and the asters are the wildflowers that are gonna be supporting the most uh, biodiversity. Sorry, just waiting for the slide, for my slide to advance here. I wonder if I hit this arrow down here. Oh, there we go. All right, perfect. All right, so in talking about our yards as places to um, increase uh, or to help wildlife, I want to um, focus on one particular uh, group of species that I think really deserve our attention, and these are the bumblebees. So bumblebees are familiar to everybody. There's actually 50 species of North American bumblebees. And bumblebees, I think, are really um, you know, Im important animals to focus on because bumblebees are like super pollinators. And I know that you know, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, pollinator conservation. And I just want to remind, sometimes I think people uh, forget why, or maybe they're embar embarrassed to ask why. Without, the, without insect pollinators, a great number of our plants will not be able to reproduce. And that includes agricultural crops that we depend on for food. So pollinators are really crucial and to everything. And um, bumblebees are especially outstanding pollinators. So what makes bumblebees such great pollinators? Well, first of all, bumblebees are able to warm their bodies by uh, vibrating their flight muscles. So this allows them to have an active foraging period uh, that goes all the way from March through November, which is even longer than uh, the introduced European honeybee. Um, and the bumblebee is, uh, it's, it's a generalist pollinator, which means that it's not restricting its pollen gathering to uh, any single group of species at any point. So it's visiting all of the flowering plants. And it has this habit of visiting a single species in succession whenever it's like, uh, you know, visiting a, like a, a garden or group of flowering plants, it will visit the flowers of a certain species before it moves on to the flowers of the next species. And this is called floral constancy. And this uh, aids in effective pollination of those flowers. The bumblebee also has physical characteristics that are uh, really advantageous as a pollinator. It's strong and it's big. And this is almost a little bit bizarre, but if you look at this picture in the um, center of the slide, the bumblebee has a really long tongue. And this means that it can, uh, so these characteristics, the strength, the size, and the tongue length enable it to access nectar in all sorts of differently shaped flowers. I have the common um, uh, flower shapes here, uh, just to the right of that uh, tongue picture. And, you know, depending on the size of the flower, not all bees would be able to access the nectar in all of these flowers, and therefore they wouldn't bother pollinating it. But the bumblebee can do it for all of them. Um, it can, you know, a long tubular flower, it'll go to that flower because it has a long tongue. Um, a flower that has the carinate shape that is kind of intricate and might be hard to open up, the bumblebee will visit that flower because it's strong enough to open up the flower and access the floral rewards. Um, down here along the bottom of the slide, I just have some additional pictures illustrating bumblebee characteristics. Um, so the bumblebee is out early uh, foraging and um, one of the spring ephemerals that has evolved to be pollinated exclusively by bumblebees is the Dutchman's Britches. Dutchman's Britches opens in April and the, uh, the bumblebee is the only native bee that is active at that time, which has the physical traits that allow it to access the nectar in the, in the Dutchman's Britches flower. 
And um, so wherever you see Dutchman's britches growing, that means a bumblebee has been there uh, in the vicinity to pollinate those flowers. The bumblebee is also visiting flowers very late in the season. Uh, frost aster blooms in November. And here's a, bum a bumblebee still visiting frost aster. Finally, bumblebees are part of a, um, a, a group of just a few different, a few different uh, uh, bee genera that are able to do something called buzz pollination. So um, some plants, their pollen is hard to access. It's uh, kind of held internally and it needs to be shaken out like the way that you would shake a salt shaker. And the way that, uh, the only way that that can happen is if the uh, stamen is vibrated uh, very rapidly. The bumblebee knows how to do it. Most other bees, including the European honeybee, they don't know how to do buzz pollination. Um, and there are some important food plants that rely on buzz pollination. These include tomatoes, peppers, uh, I wanna say blueberries, and there's a whole list that rely on uh, pollinators like bumblebees to carry out uh, buzz pollination. So bumblebees are really important. I'm now going to um, give you uh, an idea of a series of plants that you can plant in your garden if you want to support bumblebees and other pollinators. Okay, so first off, the first plant that I'm going to highlight is little blue stem. Now, what's happening? Uh, uh, so, why is it that little blue stem would be uh, a, a plant that would be helpful to bumblebees. Well, little blue stem is a grass. And you might be thinking, you know, grasses are not pollinated by insects, which is true, they aren't. They're pollinated by the wind. What's a bumblebee getting out of it? Well, <clears throat> those clumps, those uh, clumps that the little blue stem forms, down at the base, uh, the stems form a thick thatch with many cavities. And that's the perfect environment for bumblebees to build their nests. Um, bumblebees, uh, they search for cavities both above and below ground to build their nests. And the base of grass tussocks, like little blue stem, is uh, one of their favored places to build their nests. So in the upper right corner of the slide, uh, you can see uh, images of a bumblebee approaching and then uh, crawling in and among uh, the grass thatch at the base of a grass tussock and it's entering its nest there. So um, what else, why else would you want to plant little blue stem in your yard or in your garden? <clears throat> little blue stem is a really attractive grass. It has green to greenish blue foliage. It grows in uh, discrete clumps and it's a really nice way to kind of offset or um, kind of fill in around your wildflowers. Um, it's not a sod forming grass, which is more aggressive and would potentially outcompete your wildflowers. So it's a grass that complements the wildflowers well. <clears throat> it has nice color during the growing season. And you can see in the lower left corner of the slide that in the fall and winter, it gets a rich reddish tan color, which is a real bonus in terms of its aesthetics. Um, it does very well in dry and nutrient poor soils, uh, so it can grow where other plants can't. And <clears throat> it has a good wildlife value outside of um, providing a, a nesting option for bumblebees. Um, this grass uh, helps to, uh, is, a, is a host plant for a group of butterflies called the grass skippers, which are small, fuzzy, fast-flying butterflies, a uh, really interesting part of our uh, native fauna, and they use little blue stem and other grasses as host plants. Another wildlife benefit of um, <clears throat> little blue stem is its seeds are a food source for birds like the white-throated sparrow. I have a picture of a white-throated sparrow in the bottom right corner of the screen. This is a bird that's present in Ohio during migration, uh, has a, a lovely kind of bittersweet uh, song. And uh, I advise you to um, go to that link uh, 
uh, after the presentation and listen to its song because it's very nice. So that's the uh, first plant that I would recommend for supporting bumblebees and other wildlife and it's little blue stem. And now we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so first off, I'll say what's happening with our <clears throat> bumblebees this time of year. So I should be clear, that was the queen bumblebee in the, in the last slide that was starting the nest at the base of the little blue stem grass clumps. The queen bumblebee had been hibernating over the winter time, emerged in the spring and found a nest site. So after the queen bumblebee finds a nest site, she starts to raise her first, uh, her, her first generation of offspring. So in order to do this, she's collecting pollen and nectar from spring blooming flowers. She's forming that pollen and nectar into balls. She's laying an egg, a, a fertilized egg onto each of those balls of pollen and nectar. And then she's covering it up with wax and she's incubating them. When the egg hatches, it's gonna form uh, a bee larvae. And that bee larvae is gonna consume the pollen and nectar ball, and in the process is going to mature into an adult bee. The first generation of bees that the queen is raising are going to be all females, and they're going to be workers, and they're going to help her with her duties uh, after they mature. So uh, this, the spring blooming flowers are very important in order to give the queen bumblebee the pollen and nectar that she needs to raise that first generation of worker bees. This plant right here, <clears throat> blue wild indigo, uh, the Latin name is Baptisia australis. This is a really wonderful spring blooming um, flower that you could have in your garden that is a, an especial favorite of the queen bumblebees when they're doing their spring foraging. So this plant blooms in May. Um, it gets, uh, it actually gets quite large. It forms a very substantial kind of shrub. Um, it could get probably about four feet tall and just as wide or wider. Um, lovely um, spikes of uh, blue flowers. Um, it, it's, it's really a, a pretty early season wildflower. Very high tolerance <clears throat> for drought and nitrogen deficient soils. And um, some other characteristics of this plant that are uh, beneficial are that it can increase the nitrogen content of your garden soil because it has a special relationship with um, bacteria uh, along its roots that allows it to convert um, atmospheric nitrogen into nitrogen that's available in the soil. Uh, when I was um, learning about this plant, I came across a, a very interesting description of it on the webpage for the Tennessee Native Plant Society. Um, and I, I knew that, um, the, you know, these classic flowers of the American prairie had deep root systems. And this is certainly true of blue wild indigo. Um, you can see in the bottom right corner here, uh, these are images of different prairie plants and their root systems. And the blue wild indigo the roots go <laughs> past seven feet deep. But anyway, on the um, Tennessee Native Plant Society webpage, the, this woman described its roots as a steel octopus. And I thought that was just a, a great um, image <laughs> of what, what this plant's like. So um, yeah, and those deep roots are what allows it to be um, you know, resistant to drought. Uh, finally, um, the... Uh, last thing I would mention about this plant is it gets very interesting seed pods. Um, so this adds an element of aesthetic interest later in the growing season uh, after the plant has finished flowering. All right, moving on to the next plant. Let's see here. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay, so the next plant I'm going to highlight 
is a plant called smooth penstemon. And uh, so the blue wild indigo, indigo was blooming during May. The smooth penstemon is going to be uh, blooming during the month of June. And what's happening with our bumblebees during the month of June? Well, uh, what's happened is that first generation of worker bees that the uh, queen was raising, they've matured. And uh, now they have uh, left the nest and they're giving the queen bumblebee some much needed uh, assistance in her foraging and um, duty and other duties in terms of raising offspring and cleaning the nest. So one of the plants that's blooming right when this uh, first generation of workers is out foraging is the smooth penstemon. And it's a favorite of these bumblebees. Um, so this is a great plant for the home garden. Uh, it gets about three feet tall and it has really uh, interesting puffy uh, tubular flowers. They kind of look like uh, popcorn from a distance and the, the, the bumblebees crawl right up in there. Um, this plant is not picky whatsoever when it comes to soil conditions. It can go all the way from moderately wet to moderately dry soil. It handles uh, compacted soils. It'll do well in part shade or full sun. Uh, so uh, really a very handsome and nice plant for the home garden. Um, in the autumn, the leaves turn burgundy. Uh, so, you know, we think of our trees as changing color in the fall. Here's a wildflower whose leaves change color in the fall. Um, so what other uh, wildlife benefit does smooth penstemon have? Well, in addition to being a favorite of bumblebees, it is a favorite of the small carpenter bee. And um, there's a picture of a small carpenter bee over at, on the right part of the center of the screen uh, foraging inside of the um, smooth penstemon. And the small carpenter bee uh, actually has a very interesting life history. And I'm gonna share that with you now. So these bees are stem nesters. 70% um, of bees nest in the ground, but about uh, like 30% are nesting above ground. And a subset of those, maybe 20% of bees are <clears throat> nesting in uh, pithy or hollow plant stems. So uh, the small carpenter bee falls into this group. In the uh, bottom right portion of your screen, you can see a nest, uh, a series of nest cells that has been created by a small carpenter bee in the twig of a uh, sumac. So it basically the carpenter bee, the small carpenter bee just excavates out the pith that's in the center of the stem and creates a series of nest cells and uh, provisions each of those cells with a pollen and nectar ball, the same way that the um, bumblebee uh, creates a pollen and nectar ball uh, for, for her um, larvae. Now, the interesting thing about the small carpenter bee is this phenomenon called the dwarf eldest daughter. So I'm gonna tell you now the tale of the dwarf eldest daughter. And you can see the dwarf eldest daughter uh, next to her mom uh, on the right side of the screen there. The um, mother small carpenter bee uh, in the very first nest cell will put a smaller amount of pollen and nectar than she puts in the other nest cells. And what this is, what happens then is the, uh, the, the larvae that develops on that uh, pollen and nectar ball it ends up being a dwarf. It has a smaller size than its siblings. And this is always a fertilized egg, so it's a daughter. When, when this uh, little daughter bee matures, she very politely uh, climbs past all of her siblings who are still developing and seals up the partitions as she goes so that the cells stay intact. And then she meets her mom uh, at the last opening near the end of the twig, and that's called the gallery. And when she meets her mom there, um, her mom says, hi, honey, I need you to do a favor for me. I need you to go out 
and get some more pollen and nectar for your brothers and sisters. And that's exactly what she does. She goes out and forages for the whole family, the dwarf eldest daughter. She brings back pollen and nectar so that they can all survive the winter. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, a little bit of a Cinderella tale. And I think that, um, you know, if anybody uh, felt like they were maybe not favored uh, at home among their siblings, then I think that the dwarf eldest daughter, uh, small carpenter bee is your spirit animal. So you can attract small carpenter bees to your yard uh, by planting smooth, perhaps by planting smooth penstemon, which they really like. Okay, now moving on. Okay, so smooth penstemon was blooming in June. We get on now into the month of July and a really outstanding wildflower that I wanna highlight now is wild bergamot. And this is uh, Monarda fistulosa. So what's happening with the bumblebees uh, early in July? What's happening is the, um, that first generation of worker bumblebees <laughs> has allowed the queen bumblebee to really ramp things up and she is uh, laying more eggs and just producing more generations of worker bumblebees to basically just produce as many offspring as she can. And that's what's happening uh, throughout the, the first half of July. And um, there was a study done recently at Ohio State where they were looking at bumblebee use of uh, a number of wildflowers. And wild bergamot, uh, came out uh, at the top of the list. This is like one of their favorites. And there's lots of like observational data just from people saying when, when plants are in bloom, the bumblebees, they, they love going to the wild bergamot over, over other flowering plants. So this is a really great plant for them. Um, in terms of its characteristics, uh, this plant gets about two to four feet tall. It has these, uh, this really interesting uh, flower cluster at the top which is actually a group of uh, numerous long, narrowly tubular flowers. So this is one of those flowers that the bumblebee is attracted to because it has the long tongue. Short-tongued pollinators have no interest in visiting wild bergamot because they can't access the nectar. Uh, so um, you're, you're kind of isolating a certain segment of the pollinator community when you, when you plant this plant. Um, this is another very adaptable plant. Uh, it grows well from moderately wet to moderately dry, and it can do full sun to partial shade. Very similar growing conditions to the um, smooth penstemon that we were just talking about. Okie doke. So what are some other uh, wildlife benefits of the wild bergamot? Well, it attracts a really interesting um, group of diurnal moths called the clear wing moths. And you, the, the clear wing moths, you can see them here in the uh, center of the slide. They're sort of like, um, I don't know, like, <laughs> like a cross between like a, like a hummingbird and a shrimp or like a, a little lobster. They're like something out of uh, uh, Greek, Greek mythology. But what's cool about them is they, um, they, they forage for nectar while they're hovering. They don't land. So it's really fun just to watch these guys uh, flitting around your flowers and hovering in place while they're uh, gathering nectar. And um, yeah, the wild bergamot is one of their favorite plants. Um, another uh, wildlife benefit, oh yeah. And I should mention that if you want to support the clear wing moths um, in terms of like supporting their, uh, uh, their caterpillars, then you wanna plant uh, viburnum shrubs. Uh, viburnum shrubs are their host plants. That's what the caterpillars can eat. So if you have viburnum shrubs and um, plants like wild bergamot in your yard, uh, the clearwing moths would never have a reason to leave. They would, would just be so happy there. Um, now, uh, other wildlife benefits of the wild bergamot are that um, its stems are some of the favorite stems of those small carpenter bees that we were talking about on the last slide. The dwarf eldest daughter, her mom, the whole crew, they really love 
uh, building their nests in the stems of wild bergamot. Now, the stems have to be broken in order, in order for the uh, stem nesting bees to use them as a nest site. So this is important. Um, if you have a native plants garden, it's recommended that you leave the dead stalks standing at the end of the growing season uh, because they can be shelter for uh, birds and birds may be eating the seeds from the seed head over the winter time. Then in March, you cut those uh, dead stalks from the previous year to a foot or a foot and a half tall. And you just leave them like that. And that's the uh, you know best way to um, that's the best way to handle your stems in order to create habitat for the stem nesting bees like the small carpenter bee. Okay, so this was um, in the first, I was highlighting this for the first half of July. The, the plant pretty much blooms throughout July. Um, next, we're gonna be getting into the, a plant that peaks sort of later in July. And uh, this is swamp milkweed. So mm. what's, what's happening with the bumblebees uh, in the latter half of July? Well, what's happening is, uh, if you can see in the upper right part of your screen, um, the bee on the left is a male bumblebee. Up until now, the, bumble, the bumblebee queen has only been laying uh, fertilized eggs, which all become female worker bees. Now she starts uh, laying unfertilized eggs, and these are going to become the males. So those female worker bees, when they mature, they were helping the queen with all of her duties around the nest. The male bees, however, they've got an easier life. Really, their only role is to participate in reproduction. And this is true for uh, male, male bees, not only bumblebees, but all bees. The males are really only there to participate in reproduction. And if you're looking at um, bumblebees during the summertime, if you see any without a pollen basket, the bee on the left has no pollen basket. That's because it's a male and it's not collecting pollen. Um, the bee on the right has a pollen basket. That's a female. She's out collecting pollen to help out the nest. Um, the male bee, he's still uh, important as a pollinator though, because even though he's not collecting pollen, he's visiting flowers and he's drinking nectar for his own sustenance. And in doing so, he contacts the, you know, the stamens and gathers and, and gets pollen on his hairy body that way and pollinates plants in that manner. So anyway, um, swamp milkweed blooming in late July is another top-notch plant for uh, bumblebees. And this plant, uh, it gets about four feet tall. Um, it has beautiful uh, pink and white flower clusters. And um, let's see here. Now it's called swamp milkweed. So you might think, oh, I can't grow this in my yard. My yard's not a swamp, but it's not true. Um, swamp milkweed just does just fine in your soils of average moisture. So if it's just your average garden bed, swamp milkweed will do just fine. Um, every year it sends up a few more stems from its base. So within a few years, it has kind of like a shrub-like shape. It doesn't spread far and take over uh, the garden the way common milkweed can. Sometimes common milkweed can be a problematic plant in the home garden because it's a little bit aggressive. Swamp milkweed doesn't have those same tendencies. Uh, and, you know, it's just a really pretty plant. Smells great, uh, like cinnamon and vanilla. And um, yeah, so what about its other uh, wildlife value? Well, it's a milkweed. So that means it's a host plant for monarchs. And not only is it a host plant for monarchs, but it's the favorite host plant of monarchs. If you look over on the right side of your screen, that's a graphic that was um, taken from a study that was done comparing monarch, uh, monarch host use of different common milkweed species. And the female monarchs, when they were presented with a variety of milkweed plants, they would preferentially lay their eggs on the swamp milkweed. So um, that's just really cool to know. And um, yeah, you're, uh, you know, it's just, it's fun. You can, uh, 
check on your milkweed every day and see if you have a monarch caterpillar there. And it just makes you feel good if you find one. Um, I think the thing about these flowers is um, they have very accessible nectar. So unlike the wild bergamot, which was a long tubular flower shape, this is a shallow flower shape. Uh, that means short-tongued pollinators can access the nectar very easily. Um, and one of the short-tongued pollinators that really likes this is the small sweat bee. Um, small sweat bees are very abundant and they're very important pollinators of flowers like this that have shallow corollas. So other flowers that have shallow corollas are all of the sunflowers, um, a lot of plants in that genus have shallow corollas and the small sweat bees are really important for the reproduction of those plants. Small sweat bees are ground nesters. Um, you can encourage small sweat bees to nest in your garden if you have some bare soil. Uh, look on the, the center of the screen, the right of the, the right image shows a bunch of, uh, nest holes of ground nesting bees. This is what the uh, nest site looks like for uh, small sweat bees. There can be as many as 100 nests um, in a square yard. So, but that's an important piece of information for gardeners to know is that um, if you're trying to create a nest habitat for bees in your yard, um, you don't wanna cover everything up with mulch. You wanna leave some bare soil because that's gonna allow the uh, small sweat bees to uh, you know, build their nests. Okay, cool, so moving on to the next plant. All right, now we're getting into the month of August and the plant I would highlight here is tall ironweed. Um, now, let's first think about what's happening with our bumblebees during the month of August. Okay, so uh, in late July, the bumblebee nest was producing a generation of male bees. Now what it's gonna do is it's gonna produce another generation of female bees, but these aren't gonna be workers. These bees are gonna be given extra pollen and nectar so they get extra large, and these are gonna be called the gynes. And the gynes are going to be next year's queens. So that's why uh, they're given the extra resources in order to um, be very resilient. And um, if you look at this image in the top right part of the screen, you can see how much bigger uh, a gyne bumblebee is compared to a worker bumblebee. So uh, that's what's happening in August is uh, the, the nest is producing a generation of gynes. So uh, also in August, of course, um, the bees are, the bumblebees are out foraging and they really like tall ironweed. Um, and what are some characteristics of the plant? Now, this is a tall one. Uh, it usually gets about six feet tall. Um, it has pretty much the most intense purple flowers of uh, any wildflower that I know of, which is really interesting. Um, it oftentimes in natural situations will grow in association with a yellow flower called wingstem. If you look at the bottom center part of the screen, you can see wing stem and ironweed blooming together. And they're just such a great combo. They, uh, the yellow and the purple complement each other really nicely. And there's a lot of wildlife value to a plant like wing stem. So maybe if you're planting tall ironweed, you might wanna plant uh, wing stem along with it to get that nice purple and yellow combo. Um, another cool thing about wing stem is it is very resistant to herbivory one of the most resistant plants. Uh, in fact, if you're driving by like a cattle pasture and you see a bunch of tall plants growing there, it's probably ironweed. Uh, the cattle are gonna, you know, graze on everything. Uh, well, almost everything, except for the ironweed. They don't wanna touch it because they don't like how it tastes. So if you have a problem with herbivory in, herbivory in your yard, then the ironweed could be a good plant for you. All right, so in terms of, um, its wildlife value, I mentioned that it's great for bumblebees, but um, one thing that is also really cool about this plant is swallowtail butterflies love ironweed. 
I have visited um, small prairies before and the swallowtails will just fly from one ironweed to another. And it's like they're oblivious to all the other stuff that's blooming. They just love the ironweed. And um, there's this uh, trend worldwide of butterflies pre preferring plants whose nectar is high in amino acids. And there was a study done a few years ago looking at the amino acid content of uh, different like native wildflowers. And sure enough, ironweed had the highest concentration of amino acids in its nectar. So who knows? Maybe that's why the uh, swallowtail butterflies love it so much. So, oh, and that high amino acid uh, nectar, it, there's some evidence that it, it helps the butterflies um, produce more eggs and basically be more fertile. So that's your plant for August, tall ironweed. All righty, moving on. Okay, cool. Now we're getting on into September and the plant that we'll focus on here is a plant called gray goldenrod, sometimes called dwarf goldenrod. So what's going on with our bumblebees uh, during the month of September? Well, if you can see in the top right, they're, that, they're at it, they're out there mating. And um, so yeah, uh, basically, you know, it's like the gray goldenrod is the place where the, um, you know, the, the male bees and those, those guines, the soon to be queens, they might, um, you know, meet one another and, you know, uh, then the reproduction would happen. So that's what's happening uh, during, you know, the month of September at plants like gray goldenrod, which is one of their uh, favorite destinations. So um, the nice thing about gray goldenrod is this is not a goldenrod that'll take over your garden. Uh, it is fairly diminutive in size. It only grows to two and a half feet tall. Um, it uh, has a very handsome arching cluster of yellow flowers. And um, this plant has very good drought resistance. Um, so if you've got a dry area, um, this is a plant that will quite likely do very well. It also does very well in nutrient poor soils. So it's similar to um, little blue stem in terms of the growing conditions that it, that it tolerates. So what other wildlife value does gray goldenrod have to offer? Well, uh, interestingly, gray goldenrod is a favorite of this very handsome wasp in uh, the center of the screen. Now this is called the blue winged wasp. Um, it's, it really adds beauty to the garden when you see it because it's a, a great looking pollinator. Uh, it is a non-aggressive solitary nesting wasp so you don't have to worry about it stinging you. And another benefit of the blue winged wasp is it preys upon, uh, well, let's see here, beetle grubs that oftentimes infest lawns. So uh, there's very good evidence that it preys upon uh, the green June beetle. And there is, uh, you know, out there, there's some uh, kind of qualitative, anecdotal, but very persuasive stories of um, this uh, wasp being a predator on uh, Japanese beetle larvae. So um, why not invite it to the yard? And who knows, maybe it'll lower your um, population of Japanese beetles. And that's the, uh, the blue winged wasp. Um, another uh, pollinator that really likes gray goldenrod uh, and other goldenrods for that matter is the metallic green sweat bee. So this is one of our prettiest bees, almost looks like a, you know, like a flying jewel. And um, yeah, the metallic green sweat bee um, is interesting in that it, it, the, the bees kind of cooperate with one another. So they're solitary, but they form a communal nest. So the nest will have one entrance and then each mother bee will have her own um, uh, like uh, burrow extending off of that main tunnel. And, you know, they'll all act independently, but the communal nest, it's been described as a bee hotel. And the advantage 
to nesting in a communal nest like that with only one entrance is the bees can take turns guarding the entrance. So they have extra security. So in the bottom center part of your screen, you can see a, um, there's one of the uh, green metallic sweat bees uh, ferociously guarding the nest entrance. All right, now moving on to our very last plant to highlight for the home garden. And this is the New England aster. So really, <laughs> really finishing up the growing season with a bang here uh, with one of the showiest plants of all. What's happening with our bumblebees during the time that the New England aster is blooming? Well, what's happening is the, uh, the gyne bumblebees, those large female bees that are gonna be next year's queens, they have mated and now they're looking for a spot to hibernate. If you look in the top right part of your screen, uh, you can see a hibernating gyne bumblebee. What they do is they oftentimes will uh, burrow just a couple inches below ground and they will overwinter. All of the other bumblebees, the current year's queen, the workers, the males, they all perish with the first frost. So these hibernating gyne bumblebees, they carry the torch to the next year. They're the only ones that are allowing the bumblebees to persist from season to season. So it's really important uh, that they have the late season uh, nectar sources that they need to uh, fatten up and build their reserves so they can overwinter. One of those great late season sources that the uh, bumblebees really like is New England aster. Um, so this plant, uh, it can get to be uh, three to four feet tall, uh, really beautiful uh, purple and yellow flower heads. And um, it'll grow, uh, it really does well in wet places. Uh, so it could be, if you have you know, a, a wet area in your yard, this is a perfect plant for it, but it'll do well in average soils of average moisture too. Um, now those uh, yellow discs at the center of the flower, one thing that's really cool about those, and this is true of all the asters, is that those change color from yellow to reddish orange. You can see in the uh, bottom center part of the screen. And what's happening here is the plant triggers that color change when there's no more viable pollen left. So this, <laughs> this, is, a signal to, this is a signal to pollinators that they don't need to waste their time on those red orange flower heads. They should just focus on the yellow ones. And you may be thinking, well, why doesn't the plant just you know, discard those old flower heads. The reason is from a distance, keeping those flower heads there makes the floral display a lot more apparent. So the bees can see the flower display from a distance, it draws them in. And then when they get close, they see the red centers and the yellow centers and they know to go to the yellow centers. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. yeah. And mm. um, so it's just kind of like a, a secret kind of communication that's happening between uh, the flowers and the bees. And they've actually monitored, um, you know, asters before, and they've tracked that indeed, the bees do focus more on the yellow centered flowers. Um, another uh, wildlife benefit of the New England aster is it attracts hoverflies. Hoverflies, also known as surfid flies, uh, are bee mimics. They look like little bees. There's a picture of one in the center of your screen. And they like uh, shallow flowers with accessible nectar, just like the New England aster. And um, the reason that you want to have these in your yard is because their larvae eat aphids. So um, if you can get, if you can attract hoverflies to your yard, potentially they'll overwinter and the following year, you could have hoverfly larvae eating aphids and potentially uh, preventing an aphid outbreak or minimizing an aphid outbreak. On the right side of your screen, there's a picture of a um, hoverfly larvae, uh, you know, voraciously eating aphids. So that's, that's a good thing, uh, very, very beneficial in the garden. Finally, um, 
the New England aster is a favorite of migratory butterflies. So the monarch, as well as the uh, buckeye butterfly, they're flying south late in the year and they need these uh, late blooming nectar sources in order to fuel their journey. And New England aster is just perfect for them. So um, that uh, finishes up the um, selection of plants that I wanted to highlight for the garden. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I hope that, uh, you know, you, you got to s a feel for the wildlife benefits they provide, mm -hmm. especially with bumblebees. So thanks very much. Does anybody have any questions? I'm definitely seeing a number of those uh, visitors that you've highlighted, like the clear wing moth. I just saw one on the bergamot. Oh, cool. I've seen the hoverfly on the swamp milkweed. Oh, great. David? Yeah? What What is the genus and species of the gray goldenrod? I could look it up, but I'm not familiar with that. It's Sol Solidago nemoralis. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's also, it's also sometimes called dwarf goldenrod. OK. Has, has anybody um, uh, planted any of these plants in their garden? <laughs> <laughs> we have all of them. Good for you. Yeah, Except I you know, that gray goldenrod. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll be a, a nice addition. Yeah, these are kind of, um, you know, among the, uh, among the, the native plant enthusiasts, these are kind of like all-stars or, or yep. all-time all MVPs. That's really cool though. Does anybody, does anybody have any other um, plants that they want to, that they have noticed an especially high amount of pollinator activity at? Um, I, I, purple I, I purple coneflower is a favorite of bumblebees. The purple coneflower, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that, was, that, that got a good mention in that uh, study that looked at bumblebee use, yeah. I've the mountain, that. the mountain mint is very popular in my yard right now. Oh, great! Yeah, you're probably seeing some wasps on there. Yes. Yep. Yeah, mountain mint. That's another favorite. Um, we have a question from Laura. What's the difference between penstemon and foxglove beard tongue? Oh, it's the same plant. Is it that the same? <laughs> yep, same plant. <laughs> Have you, has anybody planted a plant called, um, oh, whatchamacallit, um, Culver's root? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, love how, it. How, oh, awesome, I, I've heard such good things about it. And it's so, it looks so cool. And I've, it always turns up on these lists of best plants for pollinators. Yeah, it's great. Awesome. The, the, the rains we've had have kind of, um, beating it down so it needs to be it gets so tall oh um, it, it needs to be tied up but um yeah it's gorgeous and lots of insects on it gotcha that's really cool hmm. i have a question how do i keep my jerusalem artichoke under control <laughs> any suggestions <laughs> Yeah, you know, I struggle with this myself. Um, and um, so I had, I planted a seed mix and Jerusalem artichoke was in there and some other plants and the Jerusalem artichoke just took off like crazy. And um, I find that another plant that competes well with it is the 
the Heliopsis seems to, the, like the flower bed where the Jerusalem artichoke is very abundant, it kind of, the other very common plant is, is Heliopsis. Uh, and that is a false sunflower. So maybe you could try introducing a plant like that to compete with it. Um, another very competitive plant is um, common milkweed. You know, that could potentially compete with it. Um, yeah, basically the strategy I'm trying in my garden is I'm just trying to introduce other competitive plants to that space. Um, but uh, I don't know yet whether it's going to be effective. But yeah, I, I, have, I have issues with that too. Um, this time of year, I'm seeing a couple different sizes of bumblebees. I see some pretty small ones. Are those the workers? The, the guides aren't out yet, are they? Uh, that's a good I've been question. seeing that larger size pretty much all summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that <laughs> the, the bumblebees vary in size by species. So like, um, I think that, some, like I've seen some really small ones and I think that those are just a different species, like less common. Um, most of the bumblebees you see are probably just the common Eastern bumblebee. And for those, uh, the workers are going to be smaller than the gynes. And um, the gynes will start to be active. Um, yeah, I mean, they could, they are probably going to start to come out of the nest around now, like in August. So um, uh, like late, late July and August is the beginning of the season when the gynes are active. So it could be that larger bees that you see are gynes. Um, and uh, smaller bees, they are either workers or yeah, maybe they're just a different species of bee. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't identified any other species, but yeah, I but saw I a, um, a closer look. Yeah, I saw a, a very handsome bumblebee just the other day. Uh, it was almost totally yellow on the back back end, and I think we identified it at the nursery as um, Bombus fervidus. Um, but yeah, it was a a good looking bee. I'm curious too about these different species, but it just seems like such a specialty to be able to identify, you know, the bees and these other small pollinators. And I, I admit, I, I don't know how to do it. Yeah, I do get those different little sweat bees, the metallic ones. Oh yeah. They're yeah really they, cool. they do like the swamp milkweed. Nice. Yeah. Have, have you seen any of the uh, green metallic sweat bees? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, they like the cone flowers. Yeah, I've, that makes sense. I did see a leaf cutter bee once. Oh, okay. I caught it in action. <laughs> it was cut. It was something a, a hole, a leaf in a hole. Yeah. What plant was it? Um, what what plant was it cutting? It had cut the leaf. It was stuffing the hole in my uh, wooden oh. railing around my garden. I gotcha. That's really interesting. <laughs> well, if any of you folks are up around Cleveland and you're looking to uh, pick up some native plants, please, or you're just interested in uh, touring the nursery, uh, you know, you know, please come visit. Uh, it's um, Meadow City Native Plant Nursery, and we have a, a website online. Dave, our daughter lives in Cleveland Heights, and as soon as I finish this, I'm going to call her and tell her to oh, come visit. You. Thanks. <laughs> I think we probably have uh, exceeded our okay. time slot. <laughs> no, this is fine. Um, if there's no more questions, I'm going to take the hosting back so I can stop the recording. Okie doke. I can't do it as a participant. Oh, what do I, what do, I do? Um, <laughs> I'll just reclaim host. Oh, yeah, okay. 
I'm the host now and I can stop the recording.